Hi folks, let's make this set of cufflinks. I was actually super excited to make these. They were for a fundraiser for Zane State College and Zane State has been helpful in our story, helping pair us with interns and engineering students and tying together manufacturing resources. So we were happy to pay it forward to make a couple of cufflinks for folks attending the event as well as yours truly. It was also the perfect project for this Autodesk Cam Challenge because this Cam Challenge includes tabs as well as surface finish or machining. So here's the backstory. We're machining these today after the event. What I wanted to do on Saturday, right before the event, when I had this idea with hours to spare, was a hassle-free solution that was going to get a set of cufflinks made reliably and have them look really, really good. So how do we do that? I wanted to use super glue with the powder coat tape as well as tabs within Fusion 360 because the problem with these cufflinks is they are small. 0.43 inches by 0.7 inches. Not even a half a square inch. You just don't have enough surface area to hold on to this face with super glue or vacuum. So that's luckily a pretty easy solution. We're gonna start with a relatively large piece of stock, 1.25 inches by five inches. That gives us six and a quarter square inches of surface area, which will be enough here for the super glue technique. You wouldn't wanna go whaling on this with a shear hog, but the tool paths that we've got are relatively low pressure and it should be fine. Ironically, I got along great Saturday. I actually made two pairs of these, no problems whatsoever. We had a couple of problems on the footage you're about to watch, but hey, why not share those? The first problem we had on Saturday, I actually super flied the material off when I was holding it in a vise, not, not the super glue, just between hard jaws. I wanted to show super gluing as the full workflow on this video, so I started with an adaptive to deck off the material to get it down from that quarter inch to just slightly higher than the thickness of it. The problem that I should have thought of is this pass right here. That is a slotting pass. And the reason this tool broke had more to do with the fact that I wasn't running coolant. I came back and used a 2D contour to ramp down at a little under 10% of the tool diameter here. And that helps slot that section out. And now when we come back and we do our adaptive, we already have that area slotted out and we aren't gonna have that slotting effect that's gonna cause chip welding and break our tool. The next thing we're doing is something a little bit unusual. We're using a parallel tool path with a 1 8 inch end mill with relatively small step overs. We're using the patch environment to create a larger surface to drive that parallel toolpath off the left and the right side of the part. It creates that really clean toolpath where we're leading on and off the part nice and smoothly. And the reason I'm doing this with 30 thou stepovers is the mirror finish element of the cam challenge part. So we will definitely have two lines when this parallel toolpath is done, but by using a small tool diameter with small stepovers, we're mitigating whatever tram error we have in our machine. And basically all machines, regardless of the price point, have some amount of tram error. Now, we could have used a full diameter width tool here, like the Superfly or even a large diameter end mill, and decked it across in one pass, so we wouldn't have had any step over lines it absolutely would have worked, but I don't like doing that with precarious work holding situations. So what we're doing here, minimizing that tram error with this small diameter tool. And what that means is we're gonna later sand these parts down with some 320, 400 and 600 grit sandpaper. And it's literally gonna take 10 to 20 seconds with each grit. And we're gonna have all of those tool path marks immediately gone. So it's a good trick to keep in mind. That's a little bit counterintuitive when it comes to getting good surface finishes. Using the Lakeshore 20 degree engraving tool, we're running it at four thousandths of an inch depth of cut. That's a bit deeper than I normally like to run this tool, but I want to actually create a trough that we're gonna use for a color fill here. I checked repeat passes. This tool normally doesn't raise a burr, but we're going a little bit deeper than I normally do. So coming back by and doing that spring pass can sometimes help knock off whatever burr there may be. Next, we're doing a 2D contour, stepping down to 40 thousandths of an inch above our part plenty of material left to leverage the surface area of the full piece of material as we do the work in the machining on this part. After that, we come in with a 45 degree mill drill, apply our chamfer. Again, the part is still quote unquote rigid at this point. Now I'm gonna do the color fill in the machine itself. Doing it in the machine can be nice because we can then come back 
with another parallel toolpath will stay a little over a thousandth of an inch above our part, and that's just gonna knock off the extra super glue. I mentioned though I had no problems on Saturday and I had two problems today. One of those problems was the Black Max just didn't want to take, and I think I didn't do a good enough job cleaning my part off. And when you apply this Black Max, aside from getting your part clean and free of oils and coolant, apply as little as you possibly can. It's gonna help it cure better. All we're trying to do is get that really, really deep, rich, Black Max super glue in the slot that we have machined. Let it dry, only takes a few minutes. Again, run our parallel toolpath, clean up most of that extra super glue. And then we're gonna start whittling down our part. So remember we left off with 40 thousandths of an inch stock to leave. Now we're gonna ramp down starting at 41 thousandths of an inch, going down to 20 thousandths of an inch, only leaving one thou radial stock. 20 thousandths of an inch is actually still a fair amount of material, but we're starting to get to that point where we've gotta be a little bit more careful uh, about how we have tools contacting our part, particularly on radial loads. After that, identical 2D contour, we're starting at 21 thousandths of an inch, we're going all the way through our part. In theory, when we're done, the only work holding left would be the super glue on the bottom of the part, but we're using tabs. Under geometry, Fusion makes this so easy. Remember back in the, I think it was Sprout Cam days, how difficult this was to do. Check tabs, you can choose your geometry, height, width, etc. Points, it's so easy. Just pick the points that you want them. It automatically adds the tabs in to your liking. And again, we could change the width and so forth. Just be conscious of the relationship between the tab design and how your toolpath is run. You can see the tabs there set at 50 thousandths of an inch width but then take a look at your simulation to get a real good idea of what that actually means in terms of the width of the tab. I believe it's 50 thousandths of an inch there, but it's a bit narrower here due to the radius of the tool. Nevertheless, that leaves us still with a relatively secure work holding because we've got both the super glue as well as the rest of the super glue of that raw material. And you could then take the part off and cut those tabs away, but I like to machine them away. So now we're gonna run one last 2D contour the difference this time is under passes. We're gonna say four thousandths of an inch off the side of our part. So we don't want the tool touching or bumping or putting pressure on our part. We're just knocking off most of that tab. And so all we're left with is this little blip here. It looks more pronounced in the simulation. The reality is that's something like the thickness of a sheet of printer paper. The, the other mistake I had, which is really an embarrassing mistake is I dropped my Z-plane slightly too low. You saw earlier on when we used the Heimer, we set our Z0 off the thickness of our high temp powder coat tape. And I'll be honest, usually I just don't have a problem with this. You can see on the left edge of our part today, I slightly machined into the top jaw of my vise, which I wish I hadn't done. I don't like doing that. It really was faint. I grabbed some sandpaper and after about 30 seconds, it actually had sanded right out. So it really was kind of a, a flesh wound, if you will, but nevertheless, uh, uh, I am a big advocate of this method and normally I haven't had that problem. For op two, we threw some of the high temp powder coat tape on our vice jaws. Just a nice way to prevent defects in your jaws, pressing themselves into and marring up the sides of our part. Quick spot drill and then a one eighth inch drill to get our hole for our cuff link stud. And I think this is actually really cool. So many folks ask, how do we get started? How do you find customers? How did you build your business? One of the first things I ever made were some cuff links for some friends and folks that were interested in custom cuff links. I was so nervous I wasn't gonna be able to model it or program it or hold it. I didn't know what I was doing and I figured it out. When I wanted to make these cuff links this weekend, I thought, hey, I think I've still got some of those extra cufflink backers in a drawer. And sure enough, I did. And the paperwork showed the date, 2009. And I literally haven't touched these in now 10 years. I just thought it was such a fun moment to reflect back on how far we've come and how cool it is that we can make stuff. I think these cufflinks look spectacular. They were a huge hit. Somebody getting something custom like that feels very heartwarming and endearing. Uh, polishing them with the sandpaper, again, very easy to do. I like to do it on a a scrap granite block underwater helps flush away the debris and really just a couple of grits of sandpaper 
can either give you the brushed look that I prefer, or you can step up to 800 and 1,000 grit and then use some polishing compound to get them to a true jeweled or shiny uh, polished look. Uh, and then I like to use this Renaissance wax. This stuff's really nice. It helps prevent oxidizing or tarnishing or otherwise affecting the look of that surface finish, especially because these are aluminum. And we're done. I was super excited when I made these this weekend. Literally, I thought, hey, can I get these done in a few hours? I had this idea, and again, I wanted to walk into the shop, crank these out, not have mistakes, not fight precarious work holding have a reliable solution that just did work and have the end product look stunning and for those of you out there that are starting job shops that are starting in the manufacturing space get involved with your local high school or your local community college get involved with vex robotics or other industry groups because it's doing something like this making a set of cufflinks for somebody that may be a decision maker in your town that's going to help you get involved with a board of advisors or a group of folks that are helping set the curriculum and you do it with the best of intentions to become part of that community and paying it forward and doing a good deed. But that's also how you meet people. And it's also how someone may say, oh, hey, you, you do some pretty nice work. Uh, you Are you taking on job shop work or tell me more about your shop or your program? Or are you looking to hire somebody? I've got a really good person in mind. That's how you succeed long term. Hope you folks enjoyed. Hope you learned something. Take care. See you soon.